Unfortunately, black Americans were the most vulnerable to the perfect storm of circumstances in the late 60 that has, 60s that has helped to keep an unnecessarily large number of black Americans down through an epidemic of fatherlessness. This is an area in which, no matter how uncomfortable it makes people, conservatives are simply factually correct. There are poor people all over the world who do not struggle, for instance, with high crime. The greatest correlate with criminality is fatherlessness. The psychological evidence for the importance of father love and support is incontrovertible. But remember, the black household is quite healthy at mid-century. So what happened? Uh, I argue that there's three things happening at once. One, the contraception shock which changed the strategic situation between men and women with regard to sex, marriage, and child rearing. Two, the hastening of the loss of manufacturing jobs because wages were pushed up too high by unions. And it's important to make a side note here, which is that unions almost completely excluded blacks from their inception to their downfall. So black men in particular really did have a genuine unemployment crisis. Uh, but that by itself doesn't explain it because uh, marriage was delayed but not uh, the rates didn't go down during the Great Depression. And three, the crowd out effect of great society welfare policies that perversely incentivize single motherhood. So what I'm arguing is that you need all three factors in order to explain why uh, this occurred, as well as the fact that the black community is already vulnerable, uh, economically vulnerable. <clears throat> so while many successful black people did gain an income, moved neighborhoods, became better educated, etc. By the time they did much of this, marriage had already been deeply undermined and weakened throughout the community. Uh, and there's also nothing particularly black about fatherlessness. While black out of wedlock births are at a shocking 70%, another 20% of dads live with their children. And black dads are actually more likely to be involved with their kids uh, in day-to-day -day activities. The Latino out of wedlock rate is 50%. Uh, and the white is 30%, already far above the rate that was causing Daniel Patrick Moynihan panic in 1965, looking at the uh, black community. Like other arenas such as criminal justice reform, the black community may bring an issue to our attention first because they are overrepresented uh, in being affected by it. But make no mistake, these are not specifically black problems. They affect all of us. Today, the majority of black Americans have middle-class incomes and live in the suburbs. But the literal ghettoization of urban blacks coupled with the perfect storm I just described leaves us with totally destabilized urban communities, environments. In these environments, rates of addiction, crime, and government dependency are high while employment and marriage rates are low. And I want to be very careful to make several distinctions here. One, black does not mean poor. The poverty rate among black Americans is about 20%. Now, today, that's double the white poverty rate, but there are six times as many white people in America as there are. Two, poor white rural poverty is different in the sense that it is dispersed rather than concentrated poverty. That means that things like run-ins with police will be less of an issue, but all of the other pathologies I just mentioned are absolutely there as well. Three, many poor inner city residents are the victims, not the perpetrators of crime. Remember that a functional community requires a critical mass of voluntary compliers with the law. You don't have to tip very far over that minimal number of determined criminals before the social costs really skyrocket. Why do I say all of this? Because some conservatives have a bad habit of using the term black culture to refer to the culture of a minority of inner city residents who are criminal. Why are we letting gangster rappers control our concept of black Americans, particularly given the beautiful history that I just laid out? Statistically speaking, it would be far more accurate to take our cues from someone like Tony Evans or T.D. Jakes or even Tyler Perry's movies. Um, by the way, Tyler Perry uh, has been roundly criticized by the elect for sins against wokeness. By being careful to make the distinction between the stream of healthy black culture and history and the problems of the inner city, conservatives can encourage black Americans to embrace the best things in their own uh, culture and history. Conservatives are speaking directly into the needs of these struggling communities when they fight for educational freedom. If everything I just told you about redlining and slum clearance and corrupt highway placement is true, then organizing school districts as cartels based on your zip code is nothing but the perpetuation of historically unjust policy, compounding the harm that's already been done. 
Minority parents are overwhelmingly in favor of some form of school choice, and conservatives must stand up to teachers' unions and insist that education is about children. Conservatives have another opportunity to overlap with concerns that are being raised by the black community in the arena of criminal justice reform. In the book Prison Break, How Conservatives Turned Against Mass Incarceration, Tellus describes how the prison fellowship ministry of Chuck Colson opened the eyes of many white evangelicals to the dysfunction of our criminal justice system. Do you guys know who Chuck Colson is? He was Nixon's aide and he went to prison. Anyway, he had a dramatic conversion. When a few of these ministry volunteers got into politics, they teamed up with Pew Research to show high-ranking Republican politicians in deep red states just how over the top our, our, our incarceration rates are, as well as just how much it's costing state budgets, and all of the possible alternatives that could refine the system without compromising safety. With practical wisdom, these issues were presented as overlapping with other things Republicans care about, like the growth of the administrative state, occupational licensing reform, and civil asset forfeiture. Suddenly, conservatives went from being tough on crime to smart on crime or right on crime. The most aggressive criminal justice reformers in the country are Texas, Georgia, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Did you know that? They've shut whole prisons down. And thank God the conservatives are addressing these issues. Grounded in reality and common sense, they have brought creative but realistic solutions. In the meantime, Angela Davis talks about freedom dreaming to create a world in which a panoply of government programs meet the material needs of the poor, which will eliminate crime, thus making it possible to abolish police and prisons. Someone help me understand how it's possible to be so unfamiliar with the human condition that Angela Davis can believe that young men and women whose dads are in prison, who've witnessed traumatizing violence, who've lost friends and family, whose schools are a threat to their mental and physical health, who've suffered abuse and neglect, who've witnessed or fallen prey to stultifying addiction, who've lost employment networks, and who've lost the knowledge of the fundamental building blocks of the family, will suddenly blossom into well-functioning citizens through the sweet balm of yet more government programs. Friends, 80% of black Americans want either the same number or more police on the beat. And the correlation of more police with less crime is one of the most well-established pieces of data we have in the criminal justice reform world. Real criminal justice reformers want to eliminate unaccountable policing, not police. If conservatives will be countercultural but not reactionary, they can contribute a modicum of sanity to truly necessary reform. For instance, in James Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, we learn that many of the changes in the legal structure, structure that arose in the late 60s were ushered in by new black leaders who were understandably panicking because of skyrocketing heroin addiction and crime in their communities. It was they, and particularly the black nationalists among them, concerned with black dignity, who insisted on going after dealers rather than treating drug addiction as a medical issue, which was actually a live option at the time. The leftist assumption that things which have bad effects for blacks necessarily arise from white supremacy blinds them to the solutions by blinding them to the causes. Conservatives grasp of the intricacies and importance of legal process makes them an asset in addressing hidden factors such as too much prosecutorial discretion and poor prosecutorial incentives. The boring stuff. Now that we've narrowed our focus, not on black America in general, which is doing pretty well, but to the most struggling black communities, let's explore the conservative concept of the moral imagination. The moral imagination is not only capable of grasping the difference between good and evil in the abstract, but also of bringing creativity to the form that goodness must take to address real on the ground evil. The temptation of the conservative may be to despair. Knowing how good communities function, communities that have unraveled feel hopeless. But the imaginative conservative brings hope grounded in the reality of human nature self-sacrificial love, and the bandwidth that comes from their own well-maintained lives. And I am so, so happy to report that it's been done uh, by a group of men that I call, I just made this up, the Prophets of Neighborhood Stabilization Movement. Any healthy community needs stable housing, enough to eat, employment networks, help for addiction and trauma, good education, and so many other things. 
that are sadly lacking in our most struggling communities. While some think that such problems would be easily solved through mere, mere policy changes, decades and decades of such attempts demonstrate the old classical liberal and conservative saw that central planning doesn't work nearly as well as we wish it would. Instead, I'd like to introduce you to the prophets of neighborhood stabilization, John Perkins, Bob Woodson, Robert Lupton, and Brian Fickert. These practitioners present a vision of shalom, wholeness, for our struggling neighbors that incorporates their whole personhood into the healing process. Communities whose sense of purpose, ownership, pride, and stability have been shredded over the course of decades must be rebuilt. There is much we can do by way of policy to make this process easier, but there is no policy that can generate or even regenerate the moral and cultural matrices necessary for family life and the social and economic networks that undergird flourishing. Nor should it. The greatest asset of any neighborhood is the people in it, and it ought to be them, not government or philanthropic planners who determine and drive the re rehabilitation of these neighborhoods. The thinkers I just mentioned have instigated a paradigm shift in our philanthropic models along these lines. 